I've sang that song many times. In fact, at West Point, I was silenced because I was a black man. And sometimes that was the only voice I heard, was my own voice singing. You see, to be silenced in West Point in the 1930s meant not one cadet would speak to me except when required to in the line of duty. And when we were not in the classroom and we were not in the line of duty, I was treated as an invisible man. Although I was an officer in the Air Force for this country, America, the country that I believed in and the country that I was determined to fight for, I felt like a prisoner in solitary confinement. Yet I persevered and I graduated West Point in 1936. You see, sometimes living well is the best revenge, someone once said. And I gotta tell you, outlasting my tormentors, that ain't bad either. And I believe the key to, to, to my success was I refused to show bitterness. I refused to break down in anger or resent for the extra burdens my African ancestry has placed upon me. And because of this refusal, in 1941, I had to shatter some racially prejudiced myths. You see, in 1941, through much, through much, through much, you know, fighting, it was pointed out that there were no black Air Force pilots in this army. In fact, in 1941, there were about a thousand African Americans even in the whole army, Air Force, Coast Guard, Marines, Navy, army. That was because we were excluded and we were told that, that, that we, we didn't have the mental or physical abilities for combat. And, and you can imagine the top brass insisted that we as black men did not have the ability to fly a plane in combat. And so they had this experiment, and they counted on it failing. And they put me in charge of training some of my brothers on how to fly combat missions. And so when we finally had the opportunity to fly for our country, a lot was riding on our wings. They were counting on our failure. They were counting on it, yet under my command, the 332nd Fighter Group compiled an outstanding record. And although we lost 70 of our men in World War II, I believe our proudest achievement is they assigned us to cover bombers. And not one bomber that we protected on an escort mission was ever lost to an enemy fighter. You see, some, I believe something miraculous took over. Bigotry, racism, hate, it seemed to fall away when you're at the high altitude over enemy skies and people are trying to shoot you down. And by embracing America, by embracing this country, even when some, if not most of the people, abused us at our very home, I believe our resolve and our refusal to become bitter strengthened the resolve of black men everywhere. You see, this was the 1940s, and by the end of World War II, there were close to a million African Americans enlisted. And we were being trained for every job, technical jobs, and there were even some of my sisters joining the army, something that would have been unheard of five years before. 
I left the Air Force as a lieutenant general, and I was wearing three stars. In 1998, President Clinton gave me my fourth star, made me a full general. And my 1936 classmates at West Point who silenced me, I tell you today there is not one who did not personally, empathetically, and sincerely apologize to me over the course of my career. You see, General Benjamin Davis is a virtually unknown American hero. And you may know of him because he led the Tuskegee Airmen, and we've all heard of Tuskegee Airmen, and how they played a vital role. But I want to share today that they actually played a vital role in not one, not two, but three wars. There was obviously the war with the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan, taking place in Europe and the Pacific. But then there was a war these young men fought in their very home, in Atlanta, in Tuskegee, in Chicago, in New York. It wasn't a city that was not, whether legally Jim Crow or by custom and pattern, segregated. And, 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 and segregation is a horrible, horrible thing. Because you're told you're less than, no matter where you go. One example of segregation you may not know of is when you went to buy shoes, you weren't allowed to touch the shoe. So you had to cut out little paper of your feet and walk into the white shoe store with your feet cut out and they'd basically tell you what they had and give you and there was obviously no return policy for African Americans. You think it only affected like water fountains and trains. But, but something else that's, you know, maybe some of you remember it is you literally if, if a white person was walking down the street, had to step off and bow your head. And if you were a man, you had to remove your hat and tip it, even if you didn't know this man from a hole in the wall. That was Jim Crow that General Davis grew up in. And to live under that, the, it's the third war I want to talk about. Not the war in Germany and Japan and the Pacific and Italy. Not the war that was going on in Birmingham, in Atlanta, in Montgomery, in New York, in Philadelphia, in our own capital, Washington, D.C., that was a segregated city until the 1950s. I want to talk about the third war that we all fight. And I believe it's an emotional war. I believe that inner conflict, the same that we saw in the 50s, 60s, 70s, through today, for civil rights for all men and women, and what we're experiencing today with gay Americans is no different. It's just a different flavor. Women went through it around the turn of the century. They were second-class citizens, and they had a fight for the right to vote and the fight for equality. And still to this day, a woman will work in the same job as a man and be paid between 20 and 30% less. To this day, 2012 America. But, but in every one of these struggles, I believe the people that walked those paths, the people that flew those planes, the women that paved the way, there is an inner fight. And it shows up every time we want to grow into something more than we are today. Reverend Dr. King says sometimes we create a crisis and establish such creative tension that we're forced to confront with an issue. That happens with us emotionally. We're studying a, a chapter five in the book, The Four Eight Principle, and the book is, the chapter is all about our emotional power taking it back and how we lose it, how we use it and how we improve it, how we strengthen it and how we persevere. And last week I shared with everybody, we all have parts of ourselves that we refuse to negotiate. We all have a part of ourselves that we pay less than it's worth. 
We all have a part of ourselves that we segregate to a place that we don't have to see or deal with or speak about or even acknowledge that is our part. And so at times in our life, our emotions, our feeling nature, they bring these issues to the light. You see, we can only outthink our spiritual growth so much. And sometimes we avoid it and we fight it and we'll enter into denial and we'll, we'll, we'll even pretend that we're not called to grow and we're not called to be great and we're not called to heal and we're not called to unite. We'll even come up with the greatest excuses that our mind could come up with and concoct to try and back away from the calling that God has placed in our life. But our feelings don't play that. Okay, we know what happens when we suppress our feelings. They come out sideways, they come out hard ways, they come out fast and furious, and, and even if we try, our emotions, our feelings, will force us to confront that which we just don't want to in our life. And what, what I believe is, 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 again, there's that third aspect, the third conflict, because in any conflict, we can take the path of resentment and civil war. And in our country, just so you know, more men and women died in the four years between 1861 and 1865 than if you add up every other war we've been in, including the Revolutionary War, going all the way through to the war that we're still in in Afghanistan, more men died in the four years in our civil war than every other war totaled. Okay? And, and, and so, so we can take that path and we can try and annihilate a part of ourselves in the process or we can look and realize it took real emotional strength for someone like General Davis to walk the path he did. And we can walk that path in our mind when conflict shows up. You know, I think one of the greatest gifts of emotional strength is the ability not to hold bitterness. Bitterness never breathes God. Okay, bitterness, anger, resentment, you know, never makes the best choice. It completely clouds the mind of God and the activity of the Holy Spirit in our life. There is no way being angry and resentful will lead to the highest idea in the mind of God in our lives today, no matter what path we're walking. I'm telling you, you all have a calling that is greater than the life we lead today. And we can build emotional strength. And that's that third war that goes on inside. And all we have to do is surrender to the Holy Spirit and let God be God in our life. Sometimes we may have to fake it till we make it, and that's okay. Sometimes we may have to walk that lonely path, and that's okay. Because emotional strength, the desire to demonstrate emotional strength in our spiritual life, it gives us resiliency. It offers us control, and it builds a form of toughness on our heart. And if you want to live the life God has in store for you, you need to be a little tough. You need to be a little tough around the edges, because God's call is always a great call. It's always to step out of the comfort zone. It's always to walk the road less traveled. It's always to sing the note I couldn't sing. It's always to jump higher, run faster, dance better. Whatever your calling is, it's always more. And, and right in the lobby, I was talking with one of our members, and, and you know, and, and we were joking around, but it, it just works. The tests are over when you don't feel a pulse. Okay, yesterday we celebrated a wonderful birthday of one of our members, 91 years old. I don't know, I, 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 I know you're not supposed to share a woman's age, you know, I know, but I, I just think when you're, you're over 90, 
You, right? Give it up. Come on. Come on, Mildred. Give it a wave. Huh? You know, I, I mean, come on. And, and, and all of this that I just shared as history that I'll watch on YouTube or I'll find a speech, you know, from, you know, from Marcus Garvey on, on iTunes going back 50, 60 years and try and learn about it and actually hear the voices. This was her, Mildred's life. Everything I just shared, except the Civil War <laughs> and the Revolutionary War, okay, has occurred in the life of someone seated here with us today. And I tell you, emotional strength is what God wants for us. It fuels us every time we're able to, to just breathe peace into a conflict, to breathe power into a fear, to breathe spirit into a doubt, we fuel our capacity to be more, to be more in the current moment, and to experience a fullness of life without disruption. Every time we look at negativity and refuse it to take up residence in our mind, in our heart, we, we build a better tomorrow for our self and everyone connected to us. You see, because when you're emotionally strong, when, when you're emotionally strong in, in an intelligent understanding of God as your strength, there are down moments. And the down moments are viewed through the truth that they are temporary and they are an invitation to heal something that is not God in our life. See, it's about acknowledging God rather than affirming our woes. It's about, you know, acknowledging the presence of God and not persisting on just focusing on problems. Can you imagine, can you imagine 500 children in Jacksonville in 1900 singing these words? Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. These are children that did not know liberty. Okay, Jacksonville was a segregated city. They didn't even have school past the eighth grade in Jacksonville. Okay, Daytona Beach was a segregated city. Howard Thurman had to go to a Christian Baptist school because although separate but equal was the law, they only had to give you school up till the eighth grade, and then they had these tests that were geared to have people fail, and you know who graded the test, the whole grading was coerced anyway. The whole system was set up. And, and here you have these children singing, let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies, let it re resound loud as the rolling sea. You see, the greatest display of emotional strength is to look at a problem, to look at a situation, to look at hate, and, and look right through it to what can be, to what is the potential in this situation, to what is possible. The greatest display of, 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 of emotional strength is to consciously focus our thoughts on what is noble and what is right in our life today. That is the 4 principle. If there be anything of excellence, if there be anything that is praiseworthy, think on these things. And so, so the path to emotional strength always begins with changing our focus. Changing our focus and our job is, is, is yes, it's a spiral. Emotional you know, growth, emotional healing, it's not the express elevator. Anybody who's healed can tell you, you cannot get in the elevator and just you know, hit the express button. And the goal, I think, is to keep the spiral always looking up. Our country's not healed yet today. And anybody who says it is, you know, is, is really just you know, oblivious to some of the truths that are out there right now. 
Okay, you're just oblivious. And, and that's not to discount everything I've shared about the growth, because you know I am gonna look forward. But it's to recognize this spiral, whether it's the internal one that we fight with ourselves, or the external ones that, that are called in our path or put in our path, is always to look up, always to spiral up. You see, our task is our task lies in how we interpret the events of our lives. How do we interpret them in such a way to give us power? to improve the situation? Or do we determine in such a way that we are completely powerless in, in all of the situation, that our emotions have control of us? I remember, you know, when I was growing up, I remember when I was growing up, my own life, there was a saying, you know, there was this, I don't know what you'd call it, not even a saying, but, but, but it was an excuse that anyone in my family, in fact, anyone who's Italian will know this, can lose complete emotional control, act a total fool, scream, fight, yell, curse, and it's like, oh, we're just Italian. <laughs> so, okay, anybody Italian relate? Anybody been, you know, you know, cussed up and down by their, their mom, their dad, their sister, their brother, then what, what, what? We're just Italian. Okay, no. Okay, okay. You, know, no, you know, that may be true, but, but just Italian is a wonderful thing. You know, we're just Italian. That means I cook really good. I'm really passionate. You know, I, I got the Italian Brooklyn look going on. You know what I'm saying? That's what I want people to think about when they're like, he's just Italian. And, and so it's how we interpret the situation and then improve upon it. You see, there's this interesting paradox with our emotions with our feeling nature. You know, and, and the paradox is, our emotions aren't always based upon the truth. Yet they can be a valuable sign or guide or warning sometime to let us know something's out of alignment inside of us. You know, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety attacks, you know, whether it's, you know, phobias, they're letting us know that something is calling on to be worked on inside of us. And at the same time, they can lie to us. You see, the paradox is, is they, they can't be totally trusted all the time. Yet, sometimes, when it's through intuition, they can't be denied at all. We have to honor who we are in the moment at the same time and try and become something more. And I believe the bridge is God to just go in and recognize the power and presence of God in our life. And, and that's what, you know, the book talks about what are your emotional goals? What are your emotional goals? And when I read that, I thought, I don't know. How many else? Said, well, I don't know. You know, I know financial goals, fitness goals, spiritual goals, you know, family goals, relationship goals. You know, I, I, I know my personal goals, my emotional goals. Well, what Tommy Newberry in the book says, they should not be left to chance. That we cannot afford to wing it when it comes to our emotional life and our emotional well-being. And so he says, when we give our mind a specific intention, I have a goal of joy. I am going to be joy today. I have a goal of peace. I am going to be peace today. When we give our mind a specific intention, then it serves us well. But then he says, when we feed our mind all these mixed messages, we can only, should reasonably expect chaos to show up. And this isn't new thought, and this isn't psychotherapy here. Maybe it's a little of both. But, you know, James wrote this. And James, you know, wrote 2,000 years ago. 
And he said, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking for nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting. For one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And we understand the Lord is that great law of life, that I am inside of us. And so if, if we have a power in us that we believe is, is that indwelling Christ, that perfect idea in the mind of God, and that we can connect with that power, and that we can move mountains with that power, and we're saying, move the mountain, don't. Move the mountain, don't. Move the mountain, don't. <laughs> That power is just going to create chaos in our life. I can, I can't, I will, I won't, I do, I don't. You know, you know, you know, you know, and so what are the emotions we want to fully experience and experience more often? Joy, peace, love, you know. Focus on them, double-minded, when fear and conflict and sadness show up. Embrace it for what it is. It's an opportunity to ask God within you. And, and, and you know, what is I, what do I want to create? I don't want to create this, God. I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. I want to change this, whatever it is. I want to heal this, whatever it is. I want to become this, whoever that is. Nehemiah, who rebuilt the walls, said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of God is your strength. In the eighth chapter, in the first verse of the book of Nehemiah, do you see they rebuilt the walls. If you have a wall in your life, that needs to be rebuilt, whether it's the, the self-love or the self-esteem or the self-confidence. These are walls that sometimes have been knocked down. But I promise you, just as we looked at General Davis, and I tell you, there's a hundred thousand million General Davises walking around. Dr. Oliver integrated UF, Florida, right? University of Florida. In 1961, 65. So in 1965, you were one of four. Four African Americans in 13,000, how many? 18,000 students. Believe me, Gainesville didn't throw out the red carpet and welcome them with a parade. I wasn't there, but I can tell you just from what I see, 1965 was not a good year for African Americans integrating schools. You are what, 18 years old? 17 years old. I mean, so here we have a General Davis in our own church, and if you want to read about some of it, she wrote. She wrote, see, we all have ways of, of, of healing ourselves. I always talk about journaling, I talk about prayer, I talk about testifying to other people. We had Cindy last week, it's on YouTube, watch Cindy's journey. Cindy knows what I'm talking about today. She can get up and give this sermon. Okay, she knows the spiral, she knows the inner turmoil. And, and we're not alone. We all know this. And, and, and Dr. She wrote about it, Mem Multicolor Memories of a black southern girl. Race and change in Hollywood, Florida. She writes about this area and how much it has changed. Reflections on race and change. And, and she brought them all, she donated them to the church for us to sell in our bookstore. Because the more that we heal ourselves and the more that we see Christ in another person, the less division there will be in this world. You know, we cannot separate the discussion of emotional strength
from our own inner discipline. You see, that was the key to the civil rights movement, was inner discipline. To be able to discipline one's mind and heart in the face of overwhelming violence. We've all seen the dogs. We've seen the fire hoses. Those were people that walked out of church. Those were people getting out of church on a Sunday that were marching, and all they were doing, they weren't even marching, they were just walking down a street on Sunday, saying, we have the right to walk on this street. And, and, and so, we have to walk down the streets inside of ourselves. We have to walk down the streets inside of ourselves. And the good news is, is we're here as a church to support you. We teach a prosperity class that brings us through 12 weeks of emotional healing, that really is there supporting. We have a prayer circle on Wednesday. We have individual prayer on call. We have, you know, all of these opportunities in this church because you are not alone. And so we can improve ourselves. We can win the battle within ourselves. See, because you can only have a battle when one side fights. And so if you could imagine when we're fighting with ourselves, it's very exhausting. But if just one of ourselves stopped fighting, the battle is over. This week, whatever happens, I want you to think. Think of what you heard here today. I want you to think of how we sang, lift every voice together. I want you to think about General Davis and what he had to walk through to become a four-star general. I want you to think that Mildred saw all of this in her lifetime. And if your challenge is bigger than that, then you can pout. Okay? If your challenge is bigger than a Tuskegee Airman, if your challenge is bigger than 1965 Gainesville, if your challenge is bigger than HIV or, or, or some of the things that you don't even know the person next to you is growing through and going through, then you can pout. But if not, I want you to lift your voice and sing till every earth, which represents the challenge, and heaven, which represents God's solution, ring. When you're at the harmony of, harmony of unity, in other words, bring together the solution and the problem where? In your heart and in your mind. And then I want you to be the person that walks through the office, the relationship, the, the whatever, the job interview, the doctor's office, and I want you to be the person that lets your rejoicing rise. That people look at you, let them think you are so happy and so wonderful you're crazy. Because I'll come and I'll testify for you. They ain't crazy. I told them to be a joyful presence in the universe on Sunday. Let your joy be heard as high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. And so it is and it shall be. God bless you one and all. God bless you. Come on.